So good morning to you. We are doing things a little bit different in our structure this morning because of a lot of special music, a lot of reading and things like that. This is going to be a great celebration. You're going to really enjoy today and I, I'm asking you to kind of let, let the Lord set the mood for it, okay? As we, I'll be reading some scripture and things between songs and I, I hope that you'll listen to them. I know you've heard them before, but listen to them anew. God is a God of today, and I want, to, I want you to experience that, okay? So a few things I want to announce to you, make sure that we get covered today. We will have a, a mini concert tonight. We're looking forward to that. Uh, Jeremy's going to be leading us. That starts at 5 o'clock tonight, and then once that is over, we're going to go back to the back and have a fellowship together. So bring your favorite snacks. Everybody here, it's required that you attend tonight, or we won't let you out this morning. So uh, I hope that you will. You'll come and be a part of that. I think the music uh, will be moving, and it'll just help you to get in the Christmas spirit. So I encourage you and be a part of that tonight, okay? A couple of announcements about things that we're not going to do. We're not going to have Wednesday night services this week or next week. And then next Sunday morning, because it is the morning after Christmas, no Sunday school, but we will have worship. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. It's always a moving time around the Christmas season when we do that. So next Sunday morning, 11 o'clock services only, all right? Now, one of the things, and I put a couple of slides in here to remind you that today is about the focus on giving to Lottie Moon, okay? And we, um, as we give together as the uh, Southern Baptist, it makes, the more, it makes it more powerful. So I'm encouraging you, you should have an envelope that was in there to give toward this. It goes, every cent goes to international mission work, and this is the, the biggest bulk of money that they get all year long. So I'm encouraging you to, to give, uh, and yeah, the next screen shows you that together is what it's about. And you've heard me, some of you have heard me for 30 years to say this. One of the reasons that I am Southern Baptist by choice is because of us giving together. Being able to resource together makes us a much greater buying power. It makes us much greater uh, uh, to, to get people ready for the mission field, to prepare them, all of those things. So I hope that you catch that vision and, uh, and, and that you'll give this Christmas season, okay? Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray for our morning, but I'm also going to go ahead and pray for our giving. There, there are plates up here, plates in the back, so you can take care of that. Once I sit down, we're going to run through the whole program, we're going to preach a message, so I pray for today to be alive for you, okay? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for every, every single day that we get to worship you. But God, today is special, Lord, as we focus on this Christmas season, Lord. It, there, there's, a, there's a meaning here, God, that, that you stoop down. God, uh, uh, the God that we could not understand, that we could not see, you, you slipped into flesh, and all of a sudden we could see in the life of your Son, the kindness and the graciousness and Lord, the, the compassion. And God, we thank you for, for becoming flesh for us. So Lord, as we think about that today, I pray blessing over the voices that will sing praise to you, Lord. Over the scriptures that we read, that they come alive. Over the message that we'll look at, Lord, as we learn lessons from a bunch of shepherds. And Father, I pray today that, that we don't just sit through a program, but Lord God, that we meet with you. So I pray for that heart. I pray for us to do that. And Father, as we give as a church, we pray blessing on it, and God asks that you just use us in greater and greater ways than we could ever imagine. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking a step out of the realms of glory into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray that. Amen.
Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translates means God with us. the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. You know, in Bethlehem, the human being who best understand, understood who God was and what he was doing was a teenage girl in a smelly stable. As Mary looked into the face of her baby, her son, her Lord, his majesty, she couldn't take her eyes off of him. Somehow Mary knew that she was holding God. This was he. And she remembered the words of the angel when he said, 
his kingdom will never end. He looked like anything but a king. His cry, though strong and healthy, was still the helpless and piercing cry of a baby. Majesty in the midst of the mundane. Holiness in the filth of sheep manure and sweat. Divinity entering the world on the floor of a stable, through the womb of a teenager, and in the presence of a carpenter. God came near. Truly, his kingdom will never end. May you be a part of it. those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken in all the inhabited earth. This is the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, 
who is Christ the Lord. Stand and sing with us.
What child is this? The answer to that question are myriad. Some say he was just a good teacher, but good teachers don't claim to be God. Some say he was only a good example, but good examples don't hang around prostitutes, drunks, and dirty politicians. Others say that he was a religious madman, but madmen don't speak the kind of words that he spoke, clear and lucid and perceptive and penetrating, nor do they draw women and children to themselves, nor are they served by men with the intellect of Peter and John and Luke and Paul. Some say he was a religious flake, a fake penetrating, a, perpetuating a hoax like every other would-be savior. But fakes have a way of staying dead. Others say that he was only a phantom, but phantoms don't have flesh to crucify and blood to spill. And many have said he didn't exist at all. He's only a myth. But myths don't set the calendar for history. What child is this? Pilate called him the man without fault. Diderot said he is the unsurpassed. Napoleon called him the emperor of love. Strauss said he is the highest model of religion. John Stuart Mill called him the God of humanity. Lecky said that he is the highest pattern, pattern of virtue. Picant said that he is the Holy One before God. Martineau called him the divine flower of humanity. Renan said that he is the greatest among the sons of men. Francis Cobb said he is the regenerator of humanity. Robert Owen said he is the irreproachable. What child is this? What's your answer? You know, of all, I think Thomas had it right. He looked at him and he said, My Lord and my God. Revelation 7, 12 says, Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen.
Luke chapter 2 verse 8 says, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing which, that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph, and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. We are wrapping up our Christmas series called Christmas Lessons. We looked first at, at Joseph, the silent man in Scripture. Then we looked at Mary the Blessed Virgin Mary, and today we're going to look at lessons learned from sheep handlers, okay? Have you ever had something that you thought was so important to share, and then you shared it with somebody, and it kind of was like, eh, didn't mean much. I, 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 like, I remember specifically one time, I, I had gone fishing, and I came back home, and I was telling Stacy about it. I said, Stacy, you know, we were out there fishing, and fish were not biting at all, and lo and behold, I took my jig, and I trimmed it a quarter of an inch, and, and it made all the difference in the world. I mean, they just started hammering. Every time I'd flip it by a stomp, one would hit it, and I got that great response. You know? One... What I thought was very important was not so important to my audience. I've also seen it happen the other way around, okay? That somebody thought something was unimportant, and they didn't share it, but lo and behold, when they finally came around to sharing it, it was very important, and it needed to be acted on. Again, Stacy comes up in this story because sometimes she'll come in the house, she says, oh, I've been meaning to tell you for six months that the car's pulling to the left and the tires are bouncing and it runs hot every time that I take it somewhere. Any other? Anyway, I won't go there. What we need to learn from this and something that we're going to apply today is that whether news is important or it's unimportant, it has, it's based on opinion. The coming of the Messiah, the a birth announcement of the Christ, you would think that that would be wonderful, just this amazing, important news for the religious leaders of the day of Jesus. But alas, it was not. You would have thought that it wouldn't have mattered at all to a bunch of stinking shepherds on the backside of nowhere doing their job like they do it every other night. But it was very important to them. What I want to do is learn lessons from these guys, okay? So you go with me. We're going to go quickly because I've got a lot of ground to cover. But I want to learn some lessons that I pull straight out of this story. So number one, okay, in your notes there, we don't have to go looking for God because he comes looking for us. There were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo and behold, an angel shows up. They're out there doing what they do, okay? If you can try to make it in your mind's eye mundane, that's about like it always is with a shepherd. There would be episodes when things would pop up, but nothing in this story uh, has it any other way than they're out in a field by night looking over the shepherds, picking ticks off the ones that are nearby, telling lies like men often do, and lo and behold, an angel of the Lord appears before them. They didn't go looking for God, he came looking for them, and he showed up in their midst. Surely you know that that is the way it is in your life as well. 
I mean, isn't that what Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10? The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Doesn't the Bible tell us that the good shepherd will leave the 99 and go and search and find and seek the one that is lost? That speaks to value, to value. If you've got $101 bills in your pocket and you lose one of them, it's not a good thing, but you're not going to search the entire house all day looking for it. You're just not. Why? Because it doesn't have that much value. And I've got news for you. When you find that $1, you're not going to go celebrate, call your friends on the phone, say, hey, I lost a dollar, but I found it now. They'll think you're crazy. But God places that kind of value on you. God places that kind of value on you. And though there are a billion who will worship him today, if one falls away or one is lost, he will pull away from that and take care of that one. That's the value that he places on you. And he searches and he seeks. He puts that same value that he put on you, that he puts it on other folks as well. People that don't know him or people that once know him and now they've backed away from that and they've grown cold. And the Bible tells us when that one is found, there is a great celebration. Maybe a good way for you to get yourself in the Christmas spirit is to think about what kind of celebration happened in heaven when God found you. See, the problem is not that you have not found God. The problem is, is that you have not recognized that he is here, that he is with you. The problem is never that he's not tugged at your heart because he has. If God seems distant in your life today or you don't feel any relationship with him, it's because you've pulled back. God has shown up in your pasture on the backside of nowhere in the mundane part of your life. He is there. So the problem is that you haven't done what he's asked you to do. He has made himself available to you. You don't have to go looking for him. Close your eyes. He is here. A second lesson I can learn from these guys is we should never use the excuse that we're afraid to prevent us from doing what God's asked us to do. <laughs> it said in verse 9 that the angel of the Lord stood, suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. That was when one angel showed up. Can you imagine how terrifying it was when the other multitude of heaven shows up? These heavenly hosts show up and begin to sing. They were terrified. <laughs> Yet, they did not let their terror stop their steps. Fear can paralyze. Fear can make you pull back. Fear can imprison you. In 1941... The Japanese captured Guam. In 1944, the U.S. forces took it back. And when they took it back, the Japanese forces retreated. There was a Japanese sergeant by the name of Shoichi, Shoichi Yokoi. Shoichi Yokoi, rather than following the rest of the troops, went into hiding. He went into the jungle. And in fear of being captured and being a prisoner, he carved out survival. It tells us that he had been a, 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 a seamstress when he was back home before the war, and so he used those skills as a tailor and a seamstress, and he just developed this elaborate cave system and wove these things together, and, and, and he stayed in hiding lest he be found out. So he carved out in the jungles of Guam survival, for 28 years, for 28 years, he went into hiding in 1944, he emerged in 1972, totally a prisoner of only his fear, only his fear. The war had long passed, things had been forgiven, treaties had been made, but yet he stayed hunkered down in the fear that's there. And I wonder so many times how many Christians hunker down out of fear and don't do what God asked them to do. And rather than going out and living their life and exploring and enjoying family again, they hunker down. 
in the jungle of their own confusion. Some folks are in the church and they could be leading and teaching, but they're not because they're afraid. They certainly could be witnessing, talking to the neighbor, but they don't because they're afraid. Some folks are not giving because they're afraid that God wouldn't have enough left over. (laughs) They're just not being obedient because they're afraid to give God complete control of our life. I love that the shepherds went to see Jesus even though they were terribly afraid, scared to death. A third lesson, if my religion is not inclusive of all people, then there's something wrong with my heart. Stacey and I have taken a few of those uh, all-inclusive vacations. Any of you ever been on those? All access, all the time. That's what inclusive means. All access, all the time to the beach. All access, all the time to the pool. All access, all the time to their chairs that they have down there with the little umbrellas. All access, all the time to the snacks. All access, all the time to the restaurants, to the drinks. All, All access, all the time to room service. There's no charge for that. You paid a flat fee, no other charge for that. If you're hungry 30 minutes after breakfast, get you something to eat. And I did. If you get hungry in the middle of the night, you can call room service. And I did. There are treats in your room. Eat them up because they'll be replenished magically by the time you come back the next day. All access, all the time. Want to order two entrees at dinner? Order them. And I did that more than once. All inclusive, all the time. All access, all the time. You paying attention? Jesus Christ has paid the way. He has secured the fee for our presence with the Father. And it is all access, all the time. It's all inclusive. All inclusive. The angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people, all of them, all access, all the time, all of them. When Jesus came, he came with a message specific to them. He says, I come with this, but this message is also for everybody else. You listen to me, if your religion only allows you to associate with people like you, there's something wrong with your heart. If your religion only lets you deal with people that talk like you, smell like you, think like you, vote like you, something's wrong with your heart. If your religion or in your mind, you have some idea that there's somebody out there that you don't think God could ever save or surely he didn't come for them or they're so different it couldn't be for them. If there's somebody that you can't worship with, something's wrong with your heart. This is good news for everybody. All inclusive, all access, all the time. A fourth thing, there ought to be some evidence that God lives within my heart. Notice what happened here. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The Bible tells the shepherds that there will be evidence that the Messiah lives. There will be evidence that the Messiah lives. I read a story about a guy named Dennis from K, Texas. He had not planned well. He was going on a business trip, and lo and behold, all of his clothes were dirty. Everybody's been there, done that. So he gathers them all up, and he runs down to this place. He'd seen the sign time and time again. It says, one hour dry cleaning. And he goes to them and says, I need these clothes cleaned. And they're not, oh, we can get to that, sir. And he says, I need them back within the hour. They said, oh, we can't do that. They'll be ready Tuesday. He said, Tuesday. The sign says that you did cleaning an hour. She said, oh, that's just the name of the business. That's not what we do. Saying that you're saved without some change in your life is just saying that that's what the sign says. That's not who we are. We want to have evidence that the Messiah lives in our heart. That evidence is a changed life. 
It is a different attitude that we should be different than the world, that we can be different than we used to be. I may not be what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Amen? There should be evidence in my heart that Jesus lives there, a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. A fifth lesson. You either spend your life running toward Jesus or running away from Jesus. It says in verse 15, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry, and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. The, the shepherds decided after the angel left that we need to go see this Messiah. In other words, they're running toward Jesus. We know from many stories in the Bible that's not always the case. Jonah is the most prominent example of this, of somebody that got a vision from God, God spoke to him, and he went the other way. So I learned from that, I conclude that people are always either running toward God or running away from him. And you are in one of those camps right now. Be rest assured about this. You have your running shoes on. You're going one direction or the other. There is no middle ground. There is no, no place where you can rest. You are going toward him or away from him. And I wonder about you today. Are you running toward the Lord? A sixth lesson. When God leads you to a meeting with Jesus, you simply got to tell somebody. <laughs> you paying attention? Look, look. On the opening morning of deer season, very early in the opening morning, Jim killed a beautiful nine-point buck. I mean, a pretty one. And he shot him. We go over there, and we start looking. We find him, and we're just like, Splah! you know, crazy things. And we decided it would be our little secret. <laughs> and we weren't going to tell anybody, so we just made a pie right there. We're not going to Do you think that's what happened? <laughs> Do you? Oh, my goodness. I was videoing. I was taking pictures. And we sent those. Things. Man, we told everybody at the camp. We told everybody in town. We told Jim was the star at the processor. I mean, these grown men coming there. They said, that's a good deer. I said, I can kill it. He did. What? We told everybody and sent text. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which the had been told to them about the child. Are you a child of the king? Are you grateful? Are you excited about that? Are you happy about it? Is it exciting news to your heart? Have you told a friend? A coworker? Somebody? Anybody? I read about a barber who got gloriously saved. He ran one of the old-fashioned barber shops where they still shave you and do things like that. He wanted to tell somebody. I mean, it was just burning in him. He wanted to tell somebody, but he didn't know how to do it. He wasn't very good at it. He'd never done it before. So he thought about it the whole time. This guy comes in, and he says, oh, I can't wait. To, I want to tell him about my faith, and I want to tell him about my Savior. And he, the guy says, hey, you know, will you give me a shave? So he did. And he's thinking in his mind, and he gets his razor back, and he puts that blade against his throat, and he says, are you prepared to meet God? <laughs> he had his attention, okay? He had his attention. See, a lot of times you like that barber. I, I don't know how to do it. I don't, listen, you don't need a razor. That is not the moral of that story, okay? You do not need a razor. 
But here's the way that I would answer your question. When you say, I don't know how, how did you tell them about the fish that you caught? How did you tell them? How did you tell them about the ball game that went into overtime or extra innings? How did you tell them about that? How did you talk about that? How did you tell them about the recipe that makes people moan in their mouth water? How did you tell them? I'll answer that for you. You let your delight and your passion and your joy tell them. That's how you told them. You let what was in you speak. Does that make sense? See, we back up from talking about the Lord to people, but we tell them absolutely every. I get people to tell me stuff I could care less about all the time. I can't imagine some of you that run business. I think about Tim McDaniel, all those folks coming there. I bet he hears stories he could care nothing about. Why? Because people talk about what's passionate to them. They tell the stories. Let your delight and your passion speak. The first evangelists were not professionals. They were not Bible scholars. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure because the Bible doesn't ever tell us this, that they knew much at all about Judaism, that they knew much at all about the Messiah. I think they did, but it doesn't say that. The point is, is you don't have to be a professional. You don't have to have all the answers. Good grief. I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't even have a tenth of the answers. But you can let your passion speak. You can let your heart overflow. So I would ask you this way. Has, has your life been changed by meeting Jesus? then say something. Say something. It was December of 1903. After many failed attempts and a lot of patchwork, Orville and Wilbur Wright finally got their flying machine off the ground. They were so excited. So they sent a message back to their sister Catherine. They telegraphed her, and all that it said was, we have flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. So that she hurriedly got it. She's excited about it. She goes down to the editor of the local newspaper, lays it down in front of him, and he looks down at it, and he says, how nice. The boys are going to make it home for Christmas. He overlooked the one thing that was historic news, world-changing news. He overlooked it. And that happens to a lot of people at Christmas. Happens to a lot of Christians. I know you're busy. I know a lot's going on. But we need to remind folks of the true Christmas story, do we not? the true Christmas story. But here's what I would add to that. But mostly, we need to remind ourselves. You say, well, Tim, I just went through that whole program. I could quote most of the scripture that you read, sing the songs that they sang. I could do all that. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about have a personal meeting with the Lord and remind yourself about the mystery and the magic and the master of Christmas. So would you do that? I want you to bow your head, okay? We've been through a lot of lessons learned during our Christmas series. But the main thing that I find is that God came for me. If I can put aside the crazy way that he decided to do it, with a virgin, born in a manger, all that, and, and let me just get to the, to the real message that he came for me. I 
I was at enmity with God. I was a hostile enemy to him. He should have dispatched him. But he came to him. Father God, there's no way we can fully appreciate this because we don't know the full measure of the spiritual battle of good and evil. We don't understand the the incomprehensible nature that you put before us. But we do know this, God, that I know that I am a sinner and you came for me. So, Father, I pray that every Christmas light that twinkles reminds me that you came. Every present I unwrap that I remember that Mary wrapped your son for me. Father, I pray that our lesson at Christmas is that you came for me. God, I pray if somebody feels the need to pray, Lord, they'll come to this altar if they need to talk to me. But Lord God, they they should not ignore what you're doing in their heart right now. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You stand up. We're going to sing. You come. We're going to sing all three verses whether you come or not. So come and pray. You have to Lord, I thank so much for thankful for the choir and the work that they've been in, for my wife for being a diligent leader. And uh, so, guys, I just thank you for that. I love the special, Paula, and, and I thank Jeremy for putting together a lot of this. So I just thank so many people for that. But more than anything, I thank the Lord for giving us this kind of spirit as we worship together. So I'm going to dismiss this with a word. See you tonight at 5, okay? We're going to meet in here. Here at 5 o'clock, and then we'll go back there when we're done, okay? So I'm going to dismiss with a word of prayer, and Lord bless you. God, may we never forget, Lord, what you did for us and what you do for us. So God, I just pray, Lord, right now that you touch our lives, that you help us to understand the magic that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ, God, to, to be able to see beyond this life and peer into the next. God, thank you for that gift. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.